Tom Hartman here with you, and I'm super happy to have Lori Wallach back on the line with us, the director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, uh, citizen.org slash trade and uh, tradewatch.org. Right, Lori? Tradewatch.org. There we go. So, uh, and welcome. Welcome to the program. Welcome back. It's great having you with us. Uh, the, uh, you can also tweet Lori at Wallach Lori, W-A-L-L-A-C-H-L-O-R-I. Uh, Lori, tell us about Donald Trump's bait and switch trade plan. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for having me on. And I'm sad to, to report that, yeah, that would be the theme, bait and switch, which is to say, for folks who, like me, watched that speech on Tuesday, not keen to have to listen to the whole thing, but very hopeful to hear some specifics on uh, what Trump was going to do on trade to deliver his promise to bring back American jobs, that speech was unfortunately just another piece in a direction that's getting kind of worrying, which is the man got himself elected talking about how terrible our trade agreements have been in the past. That's exactly right. And talking about how we needed to replace them to try and bring down our trade deficits and bring back American jobs. That's perfectly good goals. But since he got elected, neither in the transition nor in the months that he's been inaugurated, have we seen any actual rubber hit the road, which is to say he announced that he would formally bury the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, an agreement Congress effectively had already killed because it couldn't get through Congress in a year after it had been signed. Right. In fact, you could argue that it was effectively killed the day that Hillary Clinton came out against it. Um, before, because there already weren't congressional majorities for it. Right. But, you know, think, Tom, about what Trump said he would do. He said he'd launch NAFTA renegotiations, renegotiations of the North American Free Trade Agreement, mm -hmm. in the first 100 days of his presidency. Well, to do that, he had to give notice to Congress to do that a month ago, and he still hasn't given notice, so that's not going to happen. He said on the first day he would declare China a currency manipulator, and given... China's currency is so misaligned. It's so – for years, basically, we've been having this massive half a trillion dollar trade deficit with China based on stuff getting sold here effectively subsidized by devaluing the Chinese currency. So that would have been a good thing to get on. Didn't do that. And then last week, his Treasury Secretary, formerly of Goldman Sachs, the big Wall Street firm that has infested the administration – announced that they weren't ready to declare China currency manipulator, and they're just going to have the regular process play out in April. Well, that would be a big old missed first-day promise, and one of the few he didn't act on, including a bunch he didn't have authority to act on. Right. Here's and the, then he, okay. he's never pulled the plug on this horrible agreement called the U.S.-China Bilateral Investment Treaty. That was one of those executive orders everyone expected to see on the first day, kind of a no-brainer. It is all the worst parts of NAFTA and TPP, but with China. Hmm. It has the investment offshoring incentives. So the offshoring incentives, you leave, you get better treatment. Hmm. It has the corporate investor state tribunals. So Chinese corporations operating here could drag the U.S. government in front of three corporate lawyers who are empowered to make us pay unlimited money as taxpayers to these Chinese firms because they don't want to meet our laws. And it would give Chinese firms new rights and privileges to own and operate stuff here, buy land, et cetera, undermining our national security review. So everything Trump would hate. So everyone thought that thing was going to have the plug pulled day one with TPP. And it appears that the Goldman Sachs wing of the administration, because like the top economic guy in the White House, this guy named Gary Cohn, is another one of those Goldman Sachs guys. He's, he was number two at Goldman Sachs. He's a super smart guy, but like a Wall Street guy. He loves the China bit. And last year, there was even this Freedom of Information Act request that got that got a memo between him, an email between him and you know Obama's trade guy, Michael Froman, a.k.a. the king of the TPP, talking about how first they passed the TPP, and then that would help with the China bit. Mm. So this China treaty is really bad news, and the fact they haven't pulled the plug in that is also highly suspicious. This so it's a total gap between what he campaigned on and what's going on. Right. Uh, but but uh, unfortunately, in the United States, perception matters more than reality uh, frequently. Um, the, 
first of all, with regard to the China thing, uh, this this China treaty that you're talking about, is this something that has yet to be ratified by Congress, or is this already in place? Or what? I was unaware yeah. of this. So the China Bilateral Investment Treaty, it's called a BIT, Bilateral Investment Treaty. Right. These are negotiations that George W. Bush started in 2008 when they also started the TPP. Uh -huh. And what it does is it takes a chunk of NAFTA and TPP and expands that to China. Right. And the, 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 the Obama administration tried to finish that deal, and they got very close right before the election. So the language of the actual treaty is done. And the only thing that's left is for the U.S. and China to agree on what sectors of the economy they'll allow to be outside of these outrageous rules. And that, that sort of annex they're fighting over. But it's a, it's a treaty that's close to done that someone has to pull the plug and this, on. And this will be not called a treaty. It'll be called a trade agreement, and it'll be passed by, via fast track. No, this with... is a real honest-to-God treaty. This oh, so this is going to take two-thirds of the law. Senate. This would go through the Senate. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's uh, at least the good news. There'll probably be some resistance there. Um, Lori, we just have a minute or two left. I, I, one of the big things that really concerns me when when I saw that Peter Navarro was brought on by uh, Trump as a trade advisor, you know, I th I saw that as good news. I I know Peter Navarro. He's been on this program many many times over the years, and and he's pretty smart on trade, at least with with regard to China, but. Um, last night, I think it was, maybe it was the night before last on MSNBC, uh, Steve Kornacki was presenting some polling. I mean, these anti-free trade, in quotes, so-called free trade position has always been the position of the Democratic Party. Uh, with the single exception of PNTR for China, every one of these trade deals have been passed with a majority Republican support and a majority Re Democratic opposition. And, and what he was pointing out was that the that the uh, now that Democrats are suddenly starting to support these these trade deals, uh, more than 50 percent of Democrats support these trade deals, whereas just a year ago it was only 20 percent or in that neighborhood, whereas Republicans have gone from more than 50 percent support for trade deals down to, you know, single single digits or, you know, low teens and 20s. Um, I, you know, I wrote a book about this back in 2010 in which I, I laid this thing out and said, you know, the first party that starts embracing ending the so-called free trade is not going to lose elections any longer. And this is this is really concerning me that that uh, Democrats are just saying, well, if Trump likes it, it must be bad. Um, uh, what do we do about this? You have you have uh, you have grabbed on a very big problem, which is the polling is starting to show that because almost everything Trump says and does is upsetting. People who are upset by it assume every 100 percent of what he says is wrong, and that is lumping him and his criticisms of the trade agreements into things that must be wrong in the minds of anyone who has a problem with Trump. Right. And I think the most important – two most important things to keep in mind, Trump has heisted this issue from the left. Yep. The, the Republicans in Congress – despise his position. They're going to do everything they can to block him renegotiating NAFTA, getting rid of bad trade agreements, doing anything different. So it is really the Republican president plus the Democrats in Congress who have this position. Plus, the other piece of it is, even within this administration, all of this corporate cabinet of his opposes those takes right. on trade, All the Goldman Sachs being left-wing and democratic. And so I think it's going to be really important for folks to pay attention to those democratic voices that are – I mean, yesterday, Democratic major, Minority Leader, Democratic Senate Leader Chuck Schumer said, hey, where's that trade policy that we've been waiting for? That was the only thing about Trump that didn't upset me and my colleagues. It seems to have gone missing. Was it grabbed by the Wall Street contingent at the White House? I don't know. Where's that China declaration? Right. And that is a message folks need to get out far and wide. I, I will myself encourage Democrats to be more clear about that. Yes, we, we need to. I, we need to change this polling. I mean, this is this is scary stuff. Lori Wallach with uh, Global Trade Watch, tradewatch.org, citizen.org slash trade. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Keep up the great work.